Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee the Grand Rounds for our department. So a, a couple of Grand Rounds points before I introduce uh, Dr. Walker, uh, today's presenter. One, I, I encourage you to write comments or questions into the Q&A or the chat. Uh, there will be time at the end uh, to go through those questions with Dr. Walker. Uh, there's a group of us that works on Grand Rounds for the, for the entire series and each week, uh, including Mike Walker and Samhara Braha. Uh, we do record and archive almost all the presentations on the department website uh, under Education and Grand Rounds. Uh, this academic year's Grand Round series uh, it has funding from the Ripley Fund uh, and from the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions. Um, close to the end of the presentation, I'll put a link for a brief uh, evaluation, a four or five question evaluation in the chat. I encourage you to complete that. Uh, it helps me for planning Grand Rounds. Um, all right, so enough about the Grand Round series. Um, and now I'll move on to talking about uh, today's presenter. So today, uh, today's presenter is Dr. Sarah Walker. Uh, Dr. Walker is a psychologist and is a research associate professor uh, in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences uh, here at UW. Uh, Dr. Walker is also director of, of CoLab for Community and Behavioral Health Policy and director of the Evidence-Based Practice Institute. Uh, this is a legislatively established center in Washington State, uh, focusing on policy development impl and implementation for child and youth public mental health. Uh, Dr. Walker uh, started in, in the department uh, as a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Public Policy, subsequently took a faculty position and has uh, been a, a faculty member for the last approximate 13 years. Uh, now, Dr. Walker's research has been funded by uh, numerous organizations, uh, federal, federally funded, uh, foundation funded, um, and has received uh, as an award, Dr. Walker has received the Health Equity Award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, the research work, the implications have been cited in legislative arguments uh, across the United States, uh, specifically related to uh, confinement for uh, justice system involved youth. Uh, now, I, I'll, I'll stop there for now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Walker, and we'll uh, go from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. I appreciate that. So I'm going to share my slides. Should just hopefully it's sharing the right thing there yes wonderful okay great so i wanted to focus today on some of sort of the scholarly advancements in community engaged uh, mental health policy making trying to position this um, within the broader ecology of system and policy transformation and change um, and to do that i'm gonna start us off by talking a little bit about the state of California. Um, in 2004, California made a historic investment in mental health services uh, through the Mental Health Services Act. The act raised funds for, for mental health through a 1% income tax on incomes over $1 million called the Millionaire's Tax. It was really a dream scenario for the cash-strapped public mental health system um, providing funding for more services, providing funding for workforce training, and other kinds of initiatives. The substantive requirement of the bill was that programs needed to be innovative and have demonstrated effectiveness, which is an interesting tension that we'll talk a little bit about during this talk. Um, so in terms of a policy, it's kind of what everybody sort of wants for mental health ser services in a way. And we're really fortunate that when the, the money was distributed in Los Angeles County um, to and principal investigators out of UCSD and UCLA received NIMH funding to study the rollout. It was called the For Keep study, produced a lot of really great research um, and helped us understand uh, what exactly happened with policy implementation. And as you can see from my note here on the slide, I mean, largely what we learned is policy implementation, or in other words, keeping the intent of the policy alive through implementation is really hard to do. Um, you know, I would really encourage anybody to go to their, the 4Keeps website, it's easily Googleable. They have a lot of great studies, 
but you know, summing up over a number of the studies, about half of the trained therapists discontinued using, um, you know, evidence-based practices that they were that the funding um, provided training for. There was widespread ad, ad hoc adaptation um, of these interventions, um, meaning and meaning not a lot of them. The adaptations were not considered value add; they were considered drift from the, the original intent of the training. Um, they demonstrated that they continue to struggle in client engagement, regardless of the, 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 in, you know, the increase in training around quality services. And when they studied the implementation itself, a lot of those implementation challenges were tied to therapist and later burnout, um, negative perceptions of EBPs among other factors. So there was a lot of good that happened, right? There was a lot of um, therapists who used the interventions. There were a lot of clients that benefited, but in terms of you know policy implementation, it could have been a it could have been better potentially, right? It could have been more impactful. So if we put ourselves in the policymakers' um, seat for a moment, and you know imagine sort of being asked by taxpayers who are paying attention, you know what to do next. Um, it might occur to you that there would be two kind of potential paths. One might be to build policy that is um, kind of more explicit about the implementation structure that should be put around any kind of rollout of a program. So maybe more oversight mechanisms, more coaching available to the individual therapist, maybe more leadership support around installing um, the evidence-based practices, uh, you know, maybe more threats to agencies through contractual arrangements about, you know, what they're expected to do. The second path, and these aren't totally mutually exclusive, but, you know, in principle, the second path to go is maybe to, to look at the actual decision process that informed um, rolling out this approach to improving the mental health system. Um, maybe there needed to be a different way of deciding what what should, how those funds should have been used and how, and uh, what kinds of service improvements um, should have been implemented and potentially including more consumer, maybe more service agency um, voice in those, in that decision-making process. Um, so this is a conundrum that is facing policymakers um, now. It's arguably even more acute because of the state of the crisis that we're in with mental health services. And these are really, really, really difficult choices and they lead us to kind of uh, different sort of policy decisions or different implementation plans following policy enactment. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about that second path to sort of investigate what it has to potentially offer uh, decision making at the policy level, whether it helps us get ahead of some of these challenges with uh, policy implementation um, so that, that we can have a smoother and sort of better fitting um, rollout of services or quality improvement initiatives or whatever comes out of the policy decision package. Um, I'm going to walk through some of the scholarly models that are starting to inform this area and then use uh, one of the projects at a collab, the CARE project to illustrate, you know, just some of the specific techniques and some of the tensions and trade-offs that emerge, you know, as we do this work. And then talk a little bit about kind of what seems to be on the horizon for this area of research and practice. So I'm going to be talking a lot about theorists and scholars from the 1960s and 70s. It's really interesting in this moment, there's a lot of rediscovering of prior work um, that was slightly set aside or maybe a, a little bit forgotten about. And there's just been this real resurgence of interest in some of these um, realizations and innovations that actually were, were first really introduced um, you know, quite a few decades ago. And from the political science side, um, there was a really key figure, Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize for her work, um, in, who was really instrumental in advocating for this idea of co-production, which is basically 
the idea that rather than having, um, you know, professional kind of bureaucrats and policymakers really be the ones handed the process of creating a good policy, that engaging citizens directly in policy planning and implementation actually improves uh, policy fit and improves government services. So, you know, a nice quote from uh, Dr. Ostrom was that bureaucrats sometimes do not have the correct information while citizens and users of resources do. So some of the subsequent scholarship in this area, and a lot of the scholarship is case study based, um, but finding that when citizens are more directly engaged, not only in developing the policy, but being part of delivering services, you get a, a number of benefits, um, higher innovation potential, um, or to citizen empowerment, so leading to greater mobilization of um, citizens, which is uh, expected to lead to better governance, uh, more effective and efficient services, more mobilization of existing resources, and increased democracy. So a lot of really sort of big, heady claims for doing more just citizen engagement in, in not just policy development, but actual the, the rollout of services within government. Another uh, area of kind of influential thinking right now in this space is coming from the field of design and specifically the field of co-design. The key figures here, the contemporary key, key figures are uh, Elizabeth Sanders and Peter John Staffers. And they're pulling from a, a longer uh, history of participatory design, which is a kind of design within, as you can see in this figure that was pulled from their paper, there's a lot of different kinds of design. People have heard of user design, human-centered design, and these kinds of designs live in different poles um, from how much the subject or participant, or in our case, community member consumer, is engaged as a partner in developing ideas uh, versus being considered a subject that is um, uh, that the process is eliciting good ideas from. So on the user as partner side, lines really well with some of the goals of uh, co-production or community policy making, because a core value of that process is really to be engaging citizens in making decisions about things that directly affect them, um, rather than just trying to create better policies for them. So community mobilization being a really important part of that, and then also aligning with this um, value of user as partner in participatory design and then co-design. But technically, what the design field offers um, sort of political science and policy making is that they've developed, the design field has developed a lot of very useful um, activities, um, prompts and probes and different ways to engage diverse views and uh, different people to come around the table and sort of create a sense of shared meaning about a topic, which also aligns very well with the goals of deliberative democracy. So as somebody's trying to step into the space and think about how do we do this, how should we create um, a sense of shared meaning among individuals who are coming from really different and important perspectives, the design field actually gives us some really useful tools that we can think about using as we're engaged in those spaces. Another area that's been kind of influential in, in thinking about how else we might have uh, evidence contribute to the policymaking process um, is building off work that again, you know, Dr. Carol Weiss was really um, advancing in the 60s and 70s and has been somewhat rediscovered and reinterpreted. Um, but in this line of scholarship and inquiry, the idea of the use of research evidence um, in uh, policy making is um, not so much that one would just use research evidence to make a decision about funding a program, for example, but that social science research um, really plays a more influential role in the political space in clarifying, accelerating, or legitimating, legitimating changes in opinion. So social science operates a little bit differently as a knowledge product in, in policy and political decision-making than maybe um, you know, a technological 
a, a, a technological engineering advancement that's coming out of the physical sciences. Social science uh, products are really about ideas. What are what's influencing people? What are they persuaded by? How is science sort of in, in broadening a view or um, changing a position or helping us think about something differently? So it really kind of opens up the field of how we think about um, the ways that research evidence comes into these spaces, when it's useful and when it's not useful. And a really great quote um, which is also, there's a lot of work, a lot of great scholarship now that's coming out about the issue of values and research evidence and policymaking. And Dr. Weiss had a good quote in one of those early papers where she just said, the values issue and policymaking cannot be settled by referring to research findings. So we have to take account of the values prior to thinking about how the research evidence and research findings should come into the policymaking space. So those are some of the foundational sort of theories and models that people are starting to rediscover, to sort of build on, to investigate. Um, but right now, this is a really emerging area. And colleagues, um, co uh, colleagues of mine, some here at the University of Washington, um, we did a sort of a literature review, scoping review for folks that were publishing specifically on policy co-design. Um, there's, so there's a lot of co-design, a lot of co-production, a lot of co-creation happening in intervention development and other areas of health services research, obviously out of the research world. Um, there's a lot happening in industry and consulting. We were specifically interested in who was taking this kind of co-production, co-design lens to policymaking. And we wanted to see sort of the theories that people we're pulling from how they were organizing these engagements, and then what outcomes you know they were identifying as relevant to this um, this area and this way of doing policy policy formation and implementation. So what we found in our review was there's pr pretty consistently about six phases that occur fairly linearly, but not exactly linearly. So there's overlap. Sometimes something will circle back to another phase. But in general, there's an early phase, a middle phase, and a late phase. And in the early phase of policy co-design, which people were also using some other term, you know, some people were referring to it as co-production or they're using other terms, but it fit our definition. And in the early phase, folks were either focused first on partnership development, or first on problem definition and then partnership development, but both of those things are really important parts of standing up and engagement prior to moving into later phases. So the strategies that are listed here in this table are not intended at all to be exhaustive of all of the various strategies one could use. And there are a number of other strategies that could be really useful to any of these processes. So it's really about selecting the process that meets the need of that uh, policy ecosystem as well as the policy question. Um, but in general, partnership development looked like developing MOUs with multi-sector partners, relationship building, coalition development, bringing together committees, starting with workshops, um, different things to just start bringing people together around a particular policy idea or policy problem. In problem definition, there would, you know, people were bringing, doing literature reviews, they might, they were doing workshops, they were potentially collecting data, um, and that was starting to help clarify what would be the area of impact, um, a focus for, you know, the next phases. The middle phases are really about uh, information gathering and information synthesis. So in sort of a design engagement or sort of design thinking, you're really wanting to leave a sort of a lot of space open in the beginning, um, really coming at the problem with a beginner's mindset or a set of um, curiosities. Um, about what the problem even is. And that can be facilitated by these sort of 
fairly structured approaches to going and gathering different kinds of information that reflect different kinds of expertise. So that can look like evidence reviews, uh, stakeholder um, surveying or interviewing, um, individual team members uh, doing their own kind of observing and reflecting, uh, community story sharing. And then as these this sort of information buckets are getting gathered, there needs to be ways that this information is coming together and getting synthesized and understood and to be making meaning of all these diverse um, viewpoints. And so again, that's where some of these tools, resources can be helpful. Um, in addition to, you know, simply having discussion and dialogue about what sense people are making of all of these different sources of information, what other questions they have, and how they're understanding it all to come together. Um, once there is sort of shared meaning, and one thing that, um, you know, I'm, you know, one thing the colleagues I'm working with that are working in the same space is, you know, really viewing uh, consensus as maybe not even a quite feasible or desirable goal, but really trying to play, find the place of overlapping agreement um, around what seems the most feasible and useful while being as transformative as it can be to solve the public problem, finding that sweet spot of agreement amongst all of the different sort of co-designer stakeholders that you've brought around the table so that you can hone in on a really specific solution and policy recommendation. And, you know, in this space, um, there's really kind of three levels of, of policy that are considered. And I say this space is people who are kind of working in this like policy development, policy co-design sort of work. There could be big P policy, which are laws, regulations, um, something that sort of passed and then governs a subsequent set of decisions or how something rolls out. There's little p policy, which are more organizational agreements or institutional norms that end up governing behavior more informally, uh, kind of within an organization or with an organizational network. And then we also, in our review, included studies where the focus is really on a service innovation, like a new program or a new kind of program, but because they had engaged multiple sectors and policymakers in that process, they set that program up for greater sustainability. And we also included that under uh, policy co-design. So the recommendations that come out of that could be any one of these things or more. Um, some of the things that we saw in our review was a finalized contract or a refining of uh, program guidance, clinical practice recommendations, um, specific policy proposals, et cetera. And then in policy implementation, the policy is really vetted for broader feasibility, um, broader like buy-in and acceptability to see whether what was developed through this process is really going to solve the downstream implementation problems that we're trying to avoid. With one of the best ways of doing that is running that policy plan through multiple sectors again. So, you know, you developed an idea through this co-design process that was multi-sectored, but just checking that the thinking didn't become too insular within the co-design process ensuring it goes out to a broad range of individuals who would have a role in policy implementation. Because if what often happens with policy implementation is something rolls out and the service organizations or others who are expected to enact the policy don't agree with it, and it either gets overtly or subtly sabotaged. So getting ahead of that and giving folks uh, more opportunities to weigh in and basically signal whether or not it's going to be successful. So in terms of outcomes, it's, it's in terms of a research agenda for this area, it's, you know, it'd be very difficult to wait, you know, five years, 10 years to see 
the real world impact of the policy before we know whether we're getting policy development, um, we're doing it any better. Um, so there's some intermediate outcomes that we can be monitoring as we go to see, you know, what seems to be more or less successful in achieving these aims. And so we pulled um, from, you know, these, these uh, published and gray literature examples of policy co-design, we pulled their, the themes around what they were reporting as desirable outcomes. Um, and they match, these themes matched really well to the kind of theory of change in those foundational kind of um, sources. So, you know, we, we're sort of proposing that you basically have five key outcomes for good policy development. Uh, one is that the policy idea or plan is creative and novel. It's innovative. It's a it's a good a new approach to solving a public problem. Um, that there's multi sector alignment in buy in uh, around the plan. That it's feasible to implement. That there's an actual pathway to success that that feels like it's doable that you've mobilized community engagement, um, more citizen involvement and consumer involvement in the process as its own value, and that there's a increased understanding of what the real community or consumer or user need is as part of the process. So you've improved fit, you've ideally mobilized a greater sense of democracy and involvement in policy making, but with a plan that's feasible and that is ideally addressing the issue in a, an effective and innovative way. Those are really hard, high bars to cross for every policy. And as you can see here in this graph, we mapped um, across these studies, we mapped the level of what we called user involvement. So the intended sort of um, focus of the policy, how involved they were in developing policy, um, we mapped it at three levels, and then we looked at the self-reported outcomes in each of these studies against those levels. So when we think about consumer or user involvement in policy, there are um, a number of good frameworks. Um, a really influential one is Sherry Arnstein's ladder of public participation in government, and this her ladder has more steps. But essentially, you at the very lowest level of involvement of community, you've tokenized community at the table because you've brought into the table, but they don't have any meaningful input on the plan. Informant means you're asking people what they want, but you're not giving them any kind of real either creative contribution to the plan, and they certainly aren't being asked to veto or vet or sign off on the plan. In a representative, um, you have some representatives of different kind of um, uh, target groups who are involved in, in creation and approval of the plan, uh, but you're really relying on a kind of small, small number of people to represent very large constituencies. And in full ownership, you are taking steps to create as much sort of democratic input and process into the policy as possible. And as you can see in the graph, somebody who is um, supporting this and facilitating this has to be mindful that there, are, there may be trade-offs um, in these outcomes, depending on the, um, uh, the degree of uh, user ownership in the process. So we saw, and again, these are sort of preliminary based off what people were self-reporting, but these were not like, you know, um, objectively measured outcomes. So these are just sort of guides to what we might expect as we try to advance more evaluation and research in this area. But essentially, strong um, ownership and, and, and participation in actual policy development is likely to lead to really high community mobilization, citizen engagement, you know, activation, which is really, really desirable. But we may see potential trade-offs in novel ideas and creativity or multi-sector alignment. Um, and again, these are very preliminary and it doesn't mean that those can't all be lined up, but we may, but there may be trade-offs depending on what the policy development process should really focus on 
um, and prioritize in any given policy development scenario. Okay, so I want to spend a little bit of time to orient you to a project that our center is facilitating for Washington State, um, generously funded by the Washington State Legislature. And I am going to, we practiced this, so I am gonna hope that I can um, do the share appropriately. After all that practicing, let's see. There we go. Don't worry, you don't need to save me, Joseph. I think I've got it. <laughs> all right. I see it. You seeing it now? Yes. Okay. Care for Kids and Families is a statewide effort to improve the cultural responsivity of child and family mental health services while centering youth, caregivers, and community members with lived experience throughout the design process. This video traces the first year of care, why and how we came to be, and where we're going next. CARE began when multiple policymakers and treatment providers came together to identify the top needs in our state's publicly funded children's mental health system. Many priority areas came up in discussion. However, when participants were asked to identify the most urgent need that would improve the children's behavioral health system right now, the answer was clear, expanding culturally responsive care. We are in a child mental health crisis, and this is hitting families of color particularly hard. Because of systemic racism, people of color are more likely to be economically disadvantaged and therefore are enrolled in Medicaid at disproportionately higher rates than white people. This means that BIPOC families are also disproportionately impacted by workforce shortages, and it's critical that publicly funded behavioral health organizations are providing culturally informed and relevant care. The goal of CARE is to expand and increase diversity in the mental health workforce for Medicaid services, to support the existing workforce to deliver culturally responsive care, and to empower clinical directors and managers in supporting these two innovations. We're using a strategy called policy co-design that draws from collective wisdom and systematic knowledge to design a product that works for Washington State families. Our policy co-design strategy is centered around three levels of involvement. Our core co-design team leads the project design by integrating different knowledge sources and bringing lived and professional expertise from multiple lenses. Our broader advisory team has brought additional layers of expertise and provided valuable feedback throughout the design process. We've also gathered public input through our community sounding board, volunteers from across the state who have helped guide the initiative through feedback surveys and activities. We've pulled information from a variety of sources, including listening sessions, systematic research reviews, and strategic questions posed to our community sounding board and advisory partners, prioritizing knowledge from those with lived experience interacting with our public systems, as well as subject matter experts. Our co-design members are the information integrators of the project. Through regular facilitated meetings over the course of the past year, our co-design team members have developed a new model for culturally responsive care. As of May 2023, we've confirmed principles of culturally responsive care to guide all three goals, developed a training outline for the existing workforce, and gathered information about policy pathways for an expanded workforce. In the next year, subcommittees will finish product development for training the existing workforce, training community health workers to support child and youth mental health care, and coaching organizational leaders to implement the first two innovations. We're also partnering with policymakers and advocates interested in finding the policy pathways to pay for this workforce expansion. We plan to begin to pilot these materials in the spring of 2024 throughout the state. 
As we move forward, there will continue to be plenty of ways to be involved with this project. Visit uwcolab.org slash care to learn how you can join our community sounding board, advisory board, become a project amplifier, or join a subcommittee. Thank you for your interest in care for kids and families. We believe that through this program and with your help, we can increase and improve mental health equity in Washington State. Great. Now I have to figure out I have on YouTube to keep playing. All right, back again. All right, so yes, I wanted to show that because I felt like that would be a lot more interesting. Um, the team did such a nice job on it than me sort of rehearsing all of the things that the CARE Project has been doing. Um, I did want to, again, though, acknowledge um, the co-design team, uh, the facilitators of the co-design team meetings, not only because uh, to acknowledge their you know, contributions, but they really are in the co-design um, process, the decision makers um, you know, of the project. So they're engaged in a lot of deliberation, a lot of sharing, um, even I would say, you know, polite debate um, about some of these issues. Um, there isn't always consensus and there is a true sense of learning from each other and building a sense of um, uh, trust in the team um, and coming to more shared understanding where they can agree on, on, on these uh, policy options going forward. So that's been, uh, really incredible to watch um, uh, and a, a lot of really brilliant people in the room doing that. Uh, and then in addition, the advisory team has provided um, incredibly important uh, advice and feedback, not only to the information that, you know, the co-design team is deliberating around, but just to our own staff at CoLab and the way that we're communicating sort of between all of these different groups being accountable to sort of the feedback that's coming out of these different forums, making sure we're communicating well in all of these different spaces. And then, you know, you know, we we are trying to do a lot of communications through our own listservs, and but we have, you know, only a certain kind of um, scope and segment within the state. So and a really important part of the project is our collaboration with um, people who have agreed to be project amplifiers. And so the project amplifiers um, uh, are, are really key, particularly when we have a new request for feedback that goes out to a community sounding board. So, you know, as the um, video mentioned, we have over a hundred people statewide and growing that have registered to be part of a community sounding board that responds to questions that we send out through it to try to get as broad-based feedback as we can. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of those activities, but the Project Amplifier partners uh, really help us with um, expanding that message. And then not uh, represented on this slide, but also incredibly important is for project amplification as well as partnership is our implementation team. So we're working with um, three ACHs and the Behavioral Health um, Institute, working with the ACHs from North Sound, Spokane, Greater Columbia, and, King, and, oh, and then BHI um, in King County to start um, setting the stage for uh, the rollout of these different um, programs and packages by ensuring that we're capturing information through listening sessions and other kind of partnership strategies at the earliest phases of developing this approach so that when it goes to, to go out across the state, that um, there's alignment in sort of the need and the values and you know, the strategy. Um, and so that's been really great partnership as well. This just breaks down uh, the strategies that we're applying using this framework um, in sort of the format that I showed from our uh, scoping review, which is basically what we've been doing around partnership development, problem definition and scoping, information gathering, information synthesis, 
actual process for policy recommendation, and then policy implementation testing, which is kind of the testing for feasibility um, and buy-in across different sectors. And we're really committed to evaluating the degree to which we've actually achieved the aim of each one of those phases, um, which is used to inform our practice approach. And then of course, will be used to ideally inform sort of a broader audience who are also wrestling with these things and, and innovating and contributing to the conversation about how to do this more effectively. Um, but we had, I, you know, just as an example, you know, about three months into starting the co-design team, um, we did individual uh, debriefs with everybody and asked them how it was going. And based on the feedback that we got, we pivoted some of our approach to how the co-design team was getting engaged and how informed they were. And we were able to shift our approach around the needs of that group, that particular group is one example. And this slide was in the video and I'm just gonna highlight uh, a couple more things um, specifically around how we're trying to use evidence and how we're trying to use design strategies within this. So you can see on the left side, um, there's a nice little communication blurb that we put out. Um, Dr. Um, McKenna Parnas is a postdoctoral fellow um, who's been working with this project and she led up a team that did um, a really nice comprehensive uh, scoping review, literature review, looking at you know, what's out there in terms of non-master's um, level uh, professionals doing clinically, direct clinical work, and came back with um, four models that really emerged from the research literature. And the way that we sort of are using this evidence is um, not just selecting one and then saying, okay, well, this looks pretty effective, so let's do it. We uh, McKenna and the team actually put these into uh, storyboard comic book formats, which you can see now on the right hand of the screen under storyboard activity. Um, the co-design team um, was critical in sort of shaping some of the language and the framing of how these storyboards got um, developed to represent these sort of um, key areas of clinical, um, clinical roles and clinical activity. And then we sent those out through the community sounding board to the 100 plus folks that had um, said they would be willing to provide feedback on the project. And so folks responded to these clinical scenarios and actually were asked to kind of write in and tell us how they thought a client, a parent or a child might be feeling about that clinical counter. And so we're in the process right now of reviewing all of that information so we can really check whether this approach is gonna work in Washington state, what concerns people are having, um, or if they want to just propose something more novel than this um, so that we can bring those ideas into deliberation and thinking about what exactly should the role be of this kind of new mental health workforce um, professional. So just a little bit about kind of where we're at with the actual project, and this is sort of a shameless plug for trying to join us if this sounds interesting to you at all. We're obviously looking for really broad-based partnership. Um, the culturally responsive training um, is right now has the principles and a really strong outline, but we are now looking for um, training, a training organization partner who will help to finalize, co-create a final training approach, and then will be the organization that will hold a contract for uh, doing direct trainings and train the trainers for our kind of statewide regional partners um, and training to uh, clinicians and peers around this culturally responsive approach. So we're start, we're having the request for information right now, and then we hope to have a contract out for those trainings sometime in the summer. We're also exploring with different partner, uh, different partners who can help us develop an organizational support strategy to support um, community mental health leaders in adopting this kind of culturally responsive frame to practice in a way that um, is feasible and value add and they can feel supported for how to, how to support that change within their organizations. Um, and then the third area is uh, the community workforce pathway. So as mentioned, we've done a lot of sort of gathering information, synthesizing information, 
really looking to um, results that are coming in from our regional partners through listening sessions around sort of a community health worker role, if that is something to build a new community workforce pathway, pathway off of, but potentially a more novel role in, um, in assessing community members who have really strong natural helper listening and pathway abilities and stepping them into clinical support roles more quickly than they might otherwise because they are already really brilliant at what they do as helpers in their communities, leveraging that brilliance to try to expand the support that community mental health, health agencies are able to um, give in their local, in their local regions. So coming back a little bit to the theoretical around this, um, I think the obvious critique, I would have guessed listening to this is that it's a lot. <laughs> it's just like a lot of work. So, and it doesn't really require this much effort, time and effort. Can we get to these answers more quickly? Can we get to improving the system more quickly? Um, and I, you know, there's some, there's responses to that. You don't always, need to do something probably extensive as care for every type of policy decision. There are some sort of policy things that are common sense that everybody's going to agree with. One thing right now that our legislature's already done and we need even more action on is just an increase in the pay rate of people who choose to work in community mental health. That's just obvious. It's just about how getting it's how to get it done. Nobody disagrees with it. You don't need this kind of extensive process for something. Um, that just makes sense in that way. Um, but culturally responsive care, evidence-based practice, and new workforce roles, um, there's a lot more ambiguity there. There's a lot more um, potential for getting it wrong, um, being feeling certain about something that we shouldn't feel certain about before we really try to understand the scope of the issue and what the potential solutions are. Um, there are various models and I um, out there. One is called the split ladder of participation. It's a really nice rubric for figuring out when you might go and do a much more intensive deliberative process, um, particularly in cases where there's low agreement, um, not even just on the values, but on like the scientific basis, sort of low agreement about the topic at all, requires a lot more of an intensive process. Where, whereas when there's high values agreement and high agreement on the solution, you don't need to have such an extensive process. I also want to shout out a colleague of mine who I think um, quoted his own colleague. So I want to give them both uh, the right attribution. So my colleague, um, Derek Wheeler-Smith, who's the director of uh, the City of Seattle Office of Civil Rights, quoted his friend, Ben McBride, who's a community um, mobilizer activist and runs an organization called Empower Initiative and was really transformative with gun violence prevention in Oakland. And uh, Ben McBride uh, says, the right first question is not what do we do? The right first question is who do we become? And that's so profound and really resonates with me because on some of these topics and questions, um, everybody in the room who, who wants to be part of the solution or contribute to it ne really needs to be reflective about you know, how much they're willing to sort of learn, how much they're potentially willing to change in the service of what we need to do to make our communities um, healthier and safer. And so for some of these complex questions um, where there's lots of uh, potential values differences, it, it really means we all need to lead, lean into the willingness to learn, listen, and change. And so I thought that that was a great quote and I wanted to pass it on. Um, in term, terms of just like the tools and strategies and where to get started, um, there's a lot out there. Um, I think starting with really um, asking yourself, you know, we want to all be collaborative and we all want to do co-creative work, I think, you know, a lot of us do. Um, and really looking at the literature and asking yourself, and I ask myself this all the time, and I don't ever think I'm doing it perfectly at all. <laughs> Um, but just really engaging in a practice of reflexivity around our own motivations, how we're showing up with our partners, how we're intentionally learning from our partners, being um, uh, cognizant of our worldviews, assumptions about what knowledge is, what expertise is, um, 
why we're in this work, all of those really great questions. Um, and then how we do it, how, how we're going to engage, how we're going to be um, uh, doing coalition building, doing partnership, um, what our personal commitments are to fostering change. So I would just encourage anybody who, who is doing this work and you probably already are and could give me good tips on how do we do this together in a really reflexive and humble and curious way. So what's next for co-design and co-production? Well, one thing I think to make really clear is that this is not going to be a field, and I don't think it should be a field where somebody is going to definitively say what it is and they're going to be authoritative. I think this is going to be an area where they're going to be um, an exciting, diverse set of voices. What I do think is important is that funders and policymakers or others who are in the position of um, advancing these kinds of methods simply be conversant with just the different underlying and theories and strategies of uses. Um, not to say that some shouldn't be used, but just, just to be having conversations about what the hope for outcomes are, what are the strategies to get there, um, so we can have conversations with each other about um, how to go about this work. I also truly, I just deeply believe um, that scholars and researchers, and I put myself in that category that are trying to kind of understand this as a method, need to produce useful findings that assist real world co-design and policy co um, consulting practitioners, many of whom are um, BIPOC led organizations working in systems um, policy consulting. And we do not at all need a replication of academia sort of saying what's right and telling everybody else what to do. So when I think about the work that we're doing, um, I'm trying to think about ways that we can put tools or strategies out there that can help um, accelerate this work and that other people can use to sort of um, build out their own businesses or sort of do their work more effectively. Um, some of the key things that I think um, will advance this in the near term are accelerating the kind of pre-synthesis process, so speeding up with our rapid evidence review, synthesis of community voice, um, creating novel and interesting ways for community to engage and interact and deliberate potentially through like uh, design boards, digital forums, other sorts of ways people can interact. Um, building just professional industry networks of designers and researchers so we can respond more quickly to emerging ideas and be willing to pitch in and offer the expertise that we have within a broader engagement. And then evolving strategies in multiple sectors to blend finance for these efforts and really try to de-silo and work across systems to really support our community's health. So that is what I have. And I really encourage you all to check out the CARE Project. Um, if you feel like you see yourself in there, reach out to us and we would love to find a place for you and partner with you. And with that, I will hand it back to Joseph. Thank, thank you, Dr. Walker, uh, for, for walking us through this and examples of work and methodology. I wanna encourage any participants uh, to write in any questions as we have a few minutes here. Uh, to ask Dr. Walker questions. Um, I guess I'll, I'll lead off here. You, you mentioned that towards the end about approaching things in a humble and, and curious way. I mean, to me, that sounds a lot like clinical care of an individual patient. And I wonder um, how might a clinician translate a clinical observation? I mean, we talk a lot about translational research from laboratories to patients, that's sort of the traditional idea of it, but how does one translate a clinical observation to the kind of work that you're doing? How does that happen? Yeah, I, that's such a fantastic observation, and I totally agree with it. I think a lot of the um, what we're talking about is really analogous to the clinical skill of taking a body of scientific research about a, a medical problem or a health problem, but then in application with an individual case, you know, being very skillful about how that comes into practice and being sort of client-centered and um, being a good listener. And, and so uh, it's the same set of skills applied to just sort of a different scope. And so when we're working with um, all these different sectors and sort of these public spaces, uh, we're applying the same listening skills. Maybe we're applying some change talk, right? Or encouraging change talk. Uh, we're just sort of seeing where we land in terms of like motivation to change and what the change process will be. So. Perfect observation. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, someone wrote in and about uh, appreciating the quote. Thank you. I, and I didn't see this. Uh, there was another question that came in about regional statewide government organizations. And, um, is there variation in engagement with this model? And what, what, what have you observed there locally, statewide, regionally? Uh and then, so I'm presuming they're asking about policy, policy co-design as a model, maybe rather than like care as a model. Um, I assume too. But... Policy co-design, yeah. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it had, so nobody's, nobody that I know has done, you know, like systematic um, sort of assessment, like acceptability assessment on using this approach. Um, in general, um, we're in a zeitgeist, I think, where governments are really needing to reconcile public accountability to taxpayer funds and just really clear calls for more community engagement, um, more equity and decision making. I think that uh, policy co-design is, you know, one of many methods um, that helps reconcile those potential tensions um, and so we, you know, we've seen um, appetite for it in places that are particularly um, wanting to be responsive to community voice um, and how community gets engaged in policy. But I don't have a specific. I think it's broadly and theoretically attractive as a government strategy for reconciling those two things. I don't have like systematic data on if it really is. <laughs> Thank you. Um... I, you know, I want to encourage anyone to write in a, uh, a question. We have a couple minutes. I will pose one that stood out to me because I think about the research timeline, which is years. And so, I mean, and I think maybe policy timeline or opinion timeline can be much shorter. Uh, and how, how, is that a problem? Is it, how, how do you square that? What, what goes on? Yeah. Another excellent question. Thank you so much, Joseph. You're like hitting all the great things. Um, what doing policy co-design kind of requires is a bit of a shift in the traditional way we think about like what the researcher's role is in sort of a public problem solving engagement. A lot of times we've like traditionally thought of the researcher's role as like the public system has a question, the researcher's going to help them answer it, and those timelines are totally off. So one way to reframe it and rethink it, and I think actually what actually is really helpful to the public policy system is a deliberative decision-making process. They don't maybe necessarily need that exact study to, to sort of answer their question or make a better policy. What you need is an information-rich environment. So we shifted our work from, um, had, done, had, been, had done a fair amount of like research in partnership with institutions on a specific question and said, you know what, I think what we really need to do is just bring more information rich resources to the table from the existing research evidence base. There's a lot that's there already. So now we do more research evidence reviews. We bring sort of those findings to the table. We've been doing a study where we're giving research evidence reviews to juvenile court decision makers based on topics that they're interested in. So you don't always need to like research their program to have research be influencing in a helpful way decision making process. It's, it's interesting. There may be similar questions, but getting um, or different methods, I guess, in research terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that I haven't missed another question. Uh, I could ask questions uh, all day here. I want to make sure I haven't overlooked any. Uh, I, 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 if anyone has a last question, please please write in. Um, and I guess, Dr. Walker, in the last moments here, uh, you said also towards the end about being aware of what knowledge is, what expertise is. And I, I wonder if you might just expand on, uh, on that, uh, what, what you mean by that, as we come in as kind of academics or investigators or clinicians. Yes, I will do my best in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't pretend to have the definitive, you know, the, the, the kind of the whole point of us reflecting on what we really think of as knowledge and expertise is to actually acknowledge there's more uncertainty than we're probably usually comfortable acknowledging. And it's really to step into that uncertainty. So that's not to say that research evidence is an incredibly useful, incredibly robust knowledge. But it doesn't mean that we should just because somebody wrote, you know, did a really well designed study that without any other deliberation or any other thought about how it's going to hit the public context that we can simply say, oh, this will work. What we also need to recognize is there's is tons of expertise and knowledge that are embedded within 
public leaders, administration, leadership, consumers, those are all areas of knowledge that should stand in the same place at the table as research evidence when we're trying to solve these public problems. I, I think a great answer in one minute. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> okay, it's a very good, very helpful summary. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, and here we are at one o'clock. And Dr. Walker, I, I think uh, you know, I want to thank you for presenting in our grand round series. Uh, really interesting uh, methods, processes, um, and thinking about policy, re really large scale things. And thank you for talking over the care model uh, and for, for joining us and presenting today. And with that, we could we could leave it at that and end there. Thank you so much. Thank you.